Hello, Michel. Hello, hello. It's Thank a you. pleasure to be with you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Before we start, I, we just wanted to say thank you so much for uh, accepting to, uh, to be here today. It's really a pleasure and an honor, really, to, yeah. uh, to be able to talk to you. Oh, well, uh, all the pleasure is for me, and I hope I will reach uh, what you intend to do with, with me. <laughs> yeah, no, no worry, no worry. <laughs> so, yeah, so thank you very much for, uh, to, to be here today and just present to you what you're, you're doing, like, in life. What's your role? What's your profession? What you, you did uh, for your, your life? Well, now I'm uh, I'm retired mm -hmm. from uh, from uh, clinical um, from the clinical aspect of uh, of physiotherapy. So I, I graduated at McGill in 1982, mm -hmm. and all the, all my colleagues are laughing when I say, "Well, you know, in the 80s we were doing this and we were doing that." Yeah, uh, but it, it's been a long time, but it's been a great time to um, to work in physiotherapy because mm -hmm. uh, it, it, with time, you know everything changed so much we 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 changed from uh, uh doing what on a referral from the doctor mm -hmm. to you know a blank check yeah. now we just have a blank check and and we can do whatever we want uh, of course in the in the limit of uh, our profession exactly yeah but just mention that uh, uh, with with time uh, people in the healthcare system um could appreciate the our expertise mm -hmm. and uh, with the continued information uh, formation uh, we developed that expertise and uh, in, in every aspect of the physiotherapy so it, i come from you know from far back in in, in the past and p things really developed a lot uh, yeah. you know p the, the students are uh, or when we have students in, in rotations that are uh, at the institute or uh, or in, in any center um, you come in the center and you know you don't have to think about um, or, or you don't know how the profession developed through time you come yeah. in and the program is well established but we come from really a long time and I yeah. feel privileged to uh, have been able to uh, to work uh, to develop you know the physiotherapy in mm -hmm. the general aspect and especially for me in uh, in a uh, spinal cord you know? yes exactly because you specialize in that like kind of uh, in that sector in uh, with that population uh, for 38 years mm -hmm. and i worked for those 38 years at the institute de réadaptation gingras lindsay de montreal which mm -hmm. is now uh, in the cius uh, um, in Montreal. <laughs> yeah, it changed a lot. <laughs> a, an expertise center for a spinal cord injury. Mm -hmm. So I did my studies at McGill and then I started, I did a rotation, a final rotation in, um, in spinal cord uh, at the Institute, mm -hmm. Montreal Rehab Institute. And then I was lucky enough to, uh, to have been hired there. Mm -hmm. And I've been working there since since then. And through time, you know, I developed. Um, I worked to teaching was um, was kind of one of my hobbies. Mm -hmm. okay. So mm -hmm. uh, I worked a lot on um, on build up and building up courses. And I was fortunate enough that in uh, 1989, University of Montreal, uh, of Montreal approached me to give a course in spinal cord. Okay. So I sat down and developed the cord, uh, the, the the course with a, with a colleague, mm -hmm. and then I've been teaching at the University of Montreal since that time. Oh, and yeah. then uh, McGill in 1992 approached me to, um, to to give the course because they heard I was giving I was giving a course and they uh, they attended to the one of my course and they I guess they, they liked the way I I taught <laughs> so they hired me. Yeah. Um, because what I'm proud of is that. Uh, I, I didn't apply for those jobs. People came to me. Oh, they reached so, to you. Okay. Uh, so I, I'm kind of, this is uh, one of the proudest maybe things in, in, um, in my career yeah. uh, that I didn't have to apply. So I guess that people really liked the way I was teaching. And I always had a good comment on my, uh, on my courses. Yeah. Okay. And then in, uh, it's uh, in, in the 2000, um, years 2000, the University of Sherbrooke approached me 
to uh, to give the course, mm-hmm. uh, which I and then um, um, University of uh, uh, Laval University uh, of Ch- in Chicoutimi. Oh yeah, okay. They, they approached me, and uh, I don't remember what uh, what year, but I've been doing teaching there uh, maybe for the last uh, six or seven years. Okay. So I go there in Chicoutimi. Uh, by plane, which takes me less time than going in Montreal by oh, car. Oh yeah! Oh my <laughs> god! It's like uh, six hours if you go to by car. Well, she could see, by car. It's about six hours. Yeah, yeah. and by fly, it's like two hours maybe. It's uh, an hour. An hour? Wow, it's quick. So uh, I uh, I leave in the Thursday morning, and the Thursday morning I give my course, and I come back the, the Friday, <laughs> Friday night, which wow. kind of it, it's kind of nice. Yeah, 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 right. for sure. And, and also, I teach at the New Montreal, McGill, Chicoutimi, and, and Sherbrooke. And I taught a few years at the University of Ottawa. Also. Oh, okay, yeah. Always okay. the uh, the traumatic and non-traumatic aspect of uh, of spinal cord injury. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I was. Uh, yes? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, okay. I was just uh, curious, like, what made you go into the field of spinal cord lesions? Is that something that you've always been thinking about or it kind of changed uh, with your mm-hmm. first jobs? And yeah, it, It's funny. Well, it's not funny you ask that question because <laughs> yes, yesterday night during, during my sleep, I said I, I was figuring what kind of question I'm going to ask. <laughs> uh-huh. And that was one of the questions. Okay, <laughs> for sure. It's um, an easy well, one. Well, you know, in, in those times, I graduated in 82. Mm-hmm. So... During that time in the 70s and 80s, you know, physiotherapy was not a lot, very much recognized. Yeah. You ask people in the street, I think today it's, it's much better. Yeah. But uh, when uh, far back uh, in the 70s, 70s and the beginning of 80s, when you ask people uh, or when people ask you what you were doing, you are physiotherapy. Oh, you give massage and, yeah. and you work with a broken arm. And still arm today, and yeah. Legs. Uh, it has changed a little bit, but still, yeah. not long ago, uh, you know, mm. someone came to do my floor in, in the kitchen and he asked me what I was doing. And I said, physiotherapy, it's, oh, it's, you give massage and yeah. you bring the break. You know, it's similar, but people, yeah. they're more aware of what we do because we have developed that expertise. Mm-hmm. But in those days, um, I didn't really know what physiotherapy was. You know, we had that little book, 100 uh, Professions. And, yeah. And that, that's how, you know, we didn't have any internet or anything like that. So uh, I just looked that book, uh, through that book, but I knew I wanted to do something to help people. Mm-hmm. So I came across physiotherapy and I, I knew I wanted to go to the university and in, in the healthcare system. Okay. So... I chose uh, physiotherapy. Uh, medicine, I probably would have liked. Yeah. Retrospectively, I'm glad I didn't go because it's, oh, just, yeah. it, it's crazy. The, the life, you know, I have one of my friends who is a doctor, and mm-hmm. uh, it's, you know, you're on, with the Paget, the 24. Uh, you always do, uh, yeah. It, it, but uh, that didn't suit me because I wanted to have a family. And so I went in physiotherapy and, um, I do not regret it. That's yeah, nice. after all these years. Yeah. Wonderful yeah. career. Wonderful. Yeah, for sure. Because <laughs> yeah. you, so you that's talk... why I, do. I just wanted to help people. Yeah, okay. but why specific in neurology? Because most of the time when you go to physiotherapy, it's most of the time for uh, orthopedic stuff, so broken arms and stuff like that. But neurologic neurological aspect of it is pretty yeah, rare. Uh, well, as I said before, I did. A, an internship at the Montreal Rehab Center. Oh, okay. Uh, I did also a rotation. Okay. Uh, in, uh, in, uh, I did two things at the Montreal Rehab uh, Center. I was fortunate enough to go there because that that's a that was and is still a great center to uh, to learn. Mm-hmm. So the first in, uh, rotation was um, was with spinal cord, and then I did a, the internship with uh, hemiplegic. Okay. And so it was in neurology. Uh, but my interest, I developed um, uh, when I started working there. I I didn't really want to uh, to work with uh, people with uh, cognitive problems, you know, mm-hmm. with speech problems. Yeah. I worked a year with uh, hemiplegics. I, I liked it, but um, 
I knew that wasn't what I wanted to do the rest of my career. Mm-hmm. So uh, spinal cord suited me well in terms of personality because it's, uh, well, in those days, well, I shouldn't say that it's more dynamic. It's not true because <laughs> people working with a you know, TB, a traumatic brain injury or, or hemiplegic, they will tell you it's pretty dynamic. Yeah. But um, the, for me, Personally, the advantage of uh, working with spinal cord injuries is that you, you, it's a spinal cord injury. So it, there's no nothing wrong with a, a speech or with comprehension, yeah. with a concentration and things like that. You know? yeah. So I developed my interest in that and I was fortunate enough to, to be able to, to stay with that uh, clientele. Mm-hmm. Right. You were talking earlier about how the physiotherapy field kind of changed over the years. So you've been practicing for what, 33, 33 years? 38. 38 <laughs> Close years. Enough. <laughs> Sorry about that. So during, during that time, how, like, how has it changed in terms of, uh, in terms of practice and also in terms of uh, what kind of clients you have? I'm sure the, mm. the, if like, for example, if the mechanism of, of lesion has changed over time? Like what kind of people did you see back then and has it changed over the time? Yeah, it, it has changed uh, in terms of uh, average of age and also in terms of, uh, uh, if, if we're talking about traumatic injuries, it, it has changed in terms of, uh, of the etiology of the, the cause of, uh, of the spinal cord injury. So back then when I started practicing, we had a lot of paraplegic people. Well, it was almost, completely complete lesion okay incomplete we had some but that was kind of the Mm -hmm. exception Mm -hmm. can can i I stop you there for 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 one second could you just uh, define for the people uh, who don't know what we're talking about like complete versus incomplete lesions yeah if we uh, i'm uh, i will talk generally speaking (laughs) what i'm gonna say is not a hundred percent true but you to comprehend uh, a complete lesion is if you have for example a lesion at the level of the thorax Mm -hmm. everything below that is not working yeah so you don't have any feelings and you cannot move whereas an incomplete lesion at the same level as let's say the thorax let's say the level of the nipples well, below the level of the lesion, you could you would be able to feel and you would be able to move. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily like before, but maybe a little bit. Maybe you would retain 5% of your function, mm-hmm. maybe 95%, depending on the severity of the, of the lesion. So mm-hmm. that's the difference between a complete, where you don't have any movement, no sensation, versus incomplete, where you have the possibility of feeling and moving below the level of the lesion yeah. right okay so that if it's not clear enough ju- <laughs> no, no 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 it's pretty Excellent. it's pretty good you're a nice so teacher back, so back then yeah. uh, we had paraplegic people we had some tetraplegic people uh, mostly young young persons from car accident okay so that that was mainly what uh, what we had mm-hmm. and then it progressed on having more tetraplegic people and then the incomplete lesion uh, came in more and more where, uh, so that today it's kind of the, uh, the opposite of the statistics we had. Oh, yeah. We had when, uh, at the beginning when I started practicing. So let's say, generally speaking, if we had um, 70, 80% of the le- complete lesions ba- back then, mm-hmm. today the incomplete lesions, it's about, account for about maybe, 60 65 percent okay of all the lesions uh from from that the the actual practice now we treat more people with incomplete lesions than complete lesions whereas in the past it was completely the opposite and why is that and uh, and with time uh the uh, the severity uh uh, increased in the severity of the lesion increased in the sense that in the 70s and 80s, someone who would be, for example, who, who had a complete lesion at C4 or above, C, C3, C, uh, C3 and up uh, to C1, okay? Mm-hmm. C for cervical vertebra. So basically the upper neck level. Yeah. So if you had a lesion at the upper neck level, a complete lesion, 
you couldn't you cannot uh, breathe by yourself you have yeah. you need a ventilator so those people in the 70s mostly they died yeah so mm. with time with the advancement of technology with the better care on site Mm -hmm. uh, we are able to save those people, and now we we rehabilitate those people. We have special programs to rehabilitate people that are on ventilators, whereas before we could not because they were not um, uh, they 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 did not uh, live through their injuries. Yeah. Okay. So, so that has changed dramatically. The more right. complex lesions now, because we uh, uh, we save them. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas before they, they, they would die. Mm -hmm. And also we see more and more associated with the spinal cord lesion um, mental health problem, which is okay. not due to the spinal cord, but yeah. which are committed with the spinal cord. You know, we, we hear a lot of that, uh, the people that, especially the young people, we have, we have mental, uh, uh, mental health um, problems. Yeah. So we see that uh, as well. A lot of uh, uh, poly um, with drugs, uh, you know, associated with it, with spinal cord injury. So yeah, uh, polypharmacy. Poly so, poly oh, oh. <laughs> okay. With, uh, yeah. with that, and so we see more of those people than than before. Mm -hmm. Right. What? How come we see more people with incomplete lesions? Is there a different mechanism of uh, action for, like, the trauma is, is the trauma different for people with complete lesions versus incomplete lesions? And Not if, necessarily. No? That's why the spinal cord is so interesting. Mm -hmm. according to me. It's, and it's so weird because you can have a, for example, an injury at the upper neck level. You can have two persons with the same level of injury but with different severity. One yeah. person will be able to walk and the other one will not be able to breathe. Mm -hmm. So it's completely the opposite. Why? Mm -hmm. uh, the mechanism has not changed, um, but it's a better, on. I, I think it's better onset, um, on-site uh, care and okay. better uh, improvement in the medical field in, the, in all the technology that now we we see more incomplete lesions. So it's not necessarily a different mechanism. Okay, mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Uh, but in terms of etiology, like, like, when you asked the question uh, previously, uh, how the etiology changed through the years, it has changed because at the beginning of my practice, the majority of the lesions were due to car accident. Yeah. We still have a certain number of, uh, of lesions due to car accidents now, but uh, more we see more and more elderly people and yeah, that's crazy and, and when i say elderly the the, um, the oldest we treated i think he was kind of 98 years old wow we never saw that before you know 98 so wow we, we save those people and the majority of the elderly people the mechanism is just a fall they will trip and they fall down from their own height not from the second floor that's crazy. So because yeah. of the degenerative changes, because you know the at the um, in the, the spinal cord is in the vertebral column, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of space naturally for the yeah. spinal cord. So with age, you have less space even. So a smaller fall will will or can produce a, a spinal cord lesion, and that's what we see in in elderly people. They fall mm -hmm. from their own height. And then they end up with a spinal cord injury. Mm -hmm. And very often it's an incomplete lesion. Yeah, right. Mm. And that's crazy because um, most of the time when you talk to someone, with, uh, for example, when you, you want to talk about lesion of the spinal cord, they say, oh, probably it's because of a car accident. But as you said, now it's elderly people with only like they only fall on the ground. And that's why they, they came up with the cord lesion. Yeah. So that's crazy. So the even the mentality of the, the population didn't change, but the, the cause has changed uh, through time. Because, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Average, yeah. The average age of a spinal cord injury also, you know, when I started the practicing, 
the average age of the person was uh, a little bit under 30 years old and mm-hmm. now it's over 50 years old yeah age. so because we save more and more people that are uh, advanced in age whereas at, uh, back in the 80s and 70s those people were just died mm-hmm. right yeah did you treat more uh, traumatic spinal cord lesions or more or genetic. or more uh, like yeah e- either it was genetic or just non non traumatic so it can be some kind of cancer or tumor pressing on the spinal cord which which one do you see the most now i would say that the, uh, we see more and more non traumatic lesions mm-hmm. okay um, not because the, the statistic change that we have more non-traumatic than by non-traumatic, as you said, it could be cancer or it could be uh, an artery that, that, that just explodes. Like mm-hmm. you can have an artery, you know, in the brain that's exploding, you're producing a, an hemiplegic. Mm-hmm. But the aorta, which is the, the, the big artery, you know, in, in the thorax, the aortic, uh, uh, well, the thoracic aorta mm-hmm. can just burst and produce a spinal cord lesion. So that would be a non-traumatic. Right. A tumor, a cancer. Um, so the, the non-traumatic, uh, it's not that the, the, the statistic changed in the sense that we have more non-traumatic lesions now than traumatic. It's just that in rehab centers now, in, in, uh, in um, specialized rehab centers like the Montreal Rehab Institute, Jean Lindsay, uh, we um, we see more non-traumatic because uh, we admit them more yeah. than okay. before. And maybe I, I could say maybe there is a little less traumatic. So if we have a bed free, then we will admit a non-traumatic lesion. Mm-hmm. But okay. it's not because in the general population there are more non-traumatic lesions than before. It's not that mm-hmm. it's just okay. a matter of uh, of uh, the gestion, the, the you know the, the management, uh, managing the uh, the admissions and yeah. mm-hmm. that's All a right. big deal. Yeah. But uh, but at the beginning of my practice, uh, we saw only traumatic lesions. We, yeah, at first. Yeah, we saw the, yeah. Uh, and as as technology advanced, then you admitted yeah. like as you said and in more those and more. Days, the the non traumatic lesion mm-hmm. people. They, they just they were rehabilitated in in other centers. Is there a bit more spinal cord lesion depending on the season? For example, I know there's a lot of um, snowmobile accident in Quebec. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say there are more, but the mechanism is different according okay. to the season. Winters, yeah. yeah, ski. You could have ski accident, hockey accidents, yeah. a snowmobile. Uh, during the summer, diving accidents, uh, yeah. car accidents is throughout the years. Um, but um, yeah, the the mecha- the um, the cause of the lesion will differ from one mm. season to the other, mm-hmm. and, and that's why you know uh, often we see uh, at the be- during spring or just at the beginning of summer the the uh, the government will the uh, will the uh, advertise the, the, uh, um, the uh, prevention programs for the diet for diet yeah. uh, uh, so it, it, the, the cause differs from uh, from depending on the season yeah. yeah okay one one area that was that is a common misconception is in terms of prognosis once you have a traumatic injury let's say uh, you're you're diagnosed with a compression of uh, the spinal cord at let's say C5, C6 level. It's just a compression. There's no actual tear in the spinal cord. And then people will often have this misconception as like, well, there's no tear. So, you know, I, I may be able to walk again, but you explained this in class and it's actually quite false. Could you just yeah. explain why is it that okay. the spinal cord cannot kind of rejuvenate itself Mm -hmm. even if it's just a compression okay let's try to make this simple (laughs) that's simple it's a great question but it's complicated um 
Okay, I hear I I hear that and I heard that very often uh, in my practice. Well, you mm -hmm. know, my spinal cord is just compressed. It's not lesion. It's not mm -hmm. severed. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, as you said, uh, the end result can be the same. It will depend on the severity. And there is a, a saying. I remember being in a congress, and there was that saying that says, "Time is spine." Meaning <laughs> that if you have a compression, time is essential. You know, a spinal okay. cord uh, could survive a, comp a, a, a great compression uh, for maybe 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. After that, you start to have degeneration. And your know, spinal cord, it, it's not like a bone. It, it, if it bends or if it's compressed, it, it will not crack. You know, yeah. it's malleable, it's kind of plastic. Mm -hmm. So in, in the literature, it, it says that the spinal cord can have a high degree of compression without being severed, okay. per se. Yeah. Okay. And I remember reading one time uh, up to 70% 70, 70, oh, 70 of compression 70. Wow. 70, without having neurological deficit. Wow. So good, but it's not necessary. So, but unfortunately, it's not true to say that because you have a compression, you, you will uh, end up, uh, you will have a better uh, prognosis because mm -hmm. it depends on, uh, on the severity of the compression and how long it lasted. Okay. I remember one woman who had a, a car accident in, uh, in Abitibi, I think. It was like in the woods. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's uh, she severed her spinal cord at the neck level, and she was fortunate enough to have a uh, policeman behind. So she had her accident, and right away, they, you know, she phoned and she was transported, and she was managed, you know, uh, rapidly. And it, is it the is it because of that that she recuperated a lot? Probably, mm -hmm. you know, one can be sure for sure. Sure, but mm -hmm. uh, it's probably because of that, you know. So that's why I'm saying time is spine. So that person ended up being able to walk. Uh, oh, although, wow. you know, when we talk about spinal cord injury, and you mentioned it, uh, uh, Theodore, um, walking is yeah, very that's the big thing. That's people. yeah, yeah, that's the big thing. And uh, but for us, and for also for patients. It depends on who you're talking to. You talk to a paraplegic pay person, they will tell you walking is kind of essential. I, my goal is to recover the walking aspect. Mm -hmm. You talk to a, te a complete tetraplegic person. So a tetraplegia, you know, it's an involvement of the four extremities. So they let, they, they, it's a lesion at the neck level. So those people, they might tell you they want to walk but their priority is to recover the ability to preempt the mm -hmm. preemption because they don't have any fingers. They cannot move the, their fingers. They don't have any dexterity. Yeah. They will yeah. move your, their fingers with their, with their wrist, you know, not with the, um, with the, the fingers. fine movements, dexterity of the, of the fingers, unless the lesion is in the low neck. Mm -hmm. But those people, they want to recuperate their hands. Mm -hmm. Whereas paraplegic, they, they want to recuperate the function of, um, of, of walking. And I think for the general population, the walking aspect is very important. But if you look at the literature, what it says is, is that if someone with a spinal cord injury, you have kind of a negative bonus. And the negative bonus is you have problems with bowel and bladder. You don't right. have any control right. over your bowel and bladder. Uh, whatever the lesion, okay? Yeah. If the lesion is severe enough, of course. Um, and those people that have uh, bladder and bowel problem, if you ask them their priority, the top priority is to recuperate control of the bowel and bladder more than walking. Yeah. If you have someone yeah. with severe pain, their priority is to have a better control of pain instead of walking. Walking would come like a, the third. We have bowel, bladder, pain, and walking. Right. right. 
I think that's so important to know that what you just said, like time is spine. I think it's, it's important for people to know that as soon as you have an accident, like time is priority. And I, I personally, I didn't know that it was the, the time factor that was one of the most important. Um, yeah, At I think first, that's, yeah. yeah. That's that time, time, you know, is, yeah. time is, is because when you have the spinal cord, and again, here the literature shows that it's the, the spinal cord will be severed more yeah. from a, swell, a, a swelling that develops with the, the spine. You know, when you break a bone, it swells, it's painful mm. and it swells. Well, with the spinal cord injury, traumatic spinal cord injury, it's the same. If you have a vertebra that, that is uh, severed or fractured, it will swell, it will compress the spinal cord. Yeah. And that's the the uh, major thing, even with traumatic lesion, non-traumatic, you have, can have cancer compressing, but with traumatic, you have the swelling that compresses the spinal cord. And when you have the swelling, you interfere the blood circulation to the spinal cord. And we all know that, you know, blood brings the nutrients to uh, mm. for the nutrition, a good nutrition of the spinal cord mm -hmm. so that the, the, the neurons that compose the, the spinal cord, they can live. Yeah. If you stop the blood right. circulation, the neurons will die. And that's where you have your, uh, your neurological deficit. Right. So in that sense, time and spine. Yeah. If you have a complete, uh, if you have a, a traumatic lesion and the vertebra is fractured and the fragment cuts the spinal cord. Completely. Well, it cut, it, it, yeah. If it cuts it completely, well. It doesn't, doesn't matter that yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. The, the time is spine. Well, doesn't really apply there because the mm -hmm. spinal cord has been cut, you know? Right. And unfortunately today we cannot reconnect. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. But Maybe I, one day. On that, maybe one day, maybe one on day. that topic, are you aware of uh, any new new technology that's being uh, or like research? Is there for real? Is there? Yeah, yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, we we hear more about the you know as exoskeleton since few years back. Uh, that's not relatively relatively new, but here in Quebec, we're uh, actually uh, we're starting at the Montreal rehab JM. <laughs> we start, we, we're just starting to use exoskeleton in rehab mm -hmm. before it was used for uh, for research purposes but now we use it in rehab um, but to my knowledge actually there are no research showing that you know using an exoskeleton will be beneficial it might be beneficial but there's no um relation to cause to effect yeah okay to my to my knowledge but yeah. there are a lot of research done on that for the time but we use it because uh there's a new concept that we're starting we started to hear a couple of years ago just after I, I i retired well just before i retired we started hearing that here in quebec we call that abt activity based therapy okay yeah uh, it, it it exists uh, uh, since about the, ten years ago in the in the western part of Canada. They they were talking about that, but here in Quebec we start hearing from that and we start applying that philosophy. It's a philosophy, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that's relatively new and well, relatively new. You will talk to some people, uh, or you would talk to me, and I would say, well, we've we've been doing that since many years, the yeah. ABT, the activity-based therapy, which is basically exercises, not specific exercises. For example, for strengthening, you can give an exercise to a person to strengthen bicep, bending yeah. the elbow. That's a specific exercise. But in terms of recuperating your independence, bending the elbow will not, will help, not you help you that much. Yeah. What will help you is to strengthen in a functional way for rolling, for sitting, for standing, if you can stand, for transfer, doing push-ups to transfer with a board, without a board. So, uh, and, and we've been doing that since uh, since a long time. But mm -hmm. now we're kind of putting a word on what we're doing. And that word is 
ABT, uh, mm -hmm. activity based therapy. So it's a lot of repetition of specific activities um, that will involve muscle groups below the level of the lesion. So you will use uh, functional electrical stimulation, you will use a locomotor training on a treadmill with a support, uh, you, would, you would use weight-bearing activities. So these are kind of the components of, uh, of the ABT and, and the intensity. Now, what mm. is tough to do with that relative new philosophy here in Quebec at least, it's the intensity. Uh, as we know, the, the, uh, the length of stay in rehab centers or in even general hospitals, it's, it shortens. Yeah. You know, we, we used to have a longer uh, length of stay, but now it's so short that there's so much we can do um, in rehab. Mm -hmm. So very often those people will continue on an outpatient basis in specialized clinic. Uh, like in Montreal, we have a, a, that specialized uh, uh, rehab center. It's called a neuro concept that will okay. use kind of that philosophy mm -hmm. to, to continue the, uh, <clears throat> the rehab program. Yeah. Now, uh, is this better than anything else that remains to be seen? You know, the, We're not sure for now, even with the studies? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we'll hear more about that. We'll hear more about that. But it made sense, though. Yeah. For me, as a clinic, I'm not a research guy. I'm a clinician. <laughs> yeah. So you will tell me, well, research says that. If my clinic, my clinical experience tells me it works, I don't need a research to tell me that, well, yeah. yes, in fact, it works. You don't need to I wait know. for the study to be finished before starting your intervention yeah. or yeah we need we need the research i'm not saying it's not good it, yeah. it's just I'm saying that we've been doing a lot of things since many many years that are not that have not been studied but we know clinically that you know that it works mm -hmm. so the abt is something that we'll hear more in spinal cord yeah uh, new techniques is a, a nerve transfer. I don't know if you, um, you've heard about tendon transfers, the transfer yeah. and tendon to make the, uh, the activity more, uh, inc uh, 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 more, more efficient. For example, efficient. if you have a weak tricep, you can transfer one tendon of a good muscle to the mm -hmm. tricep that will permit you to extend your elbow, mm -hmm. yeah. which permits you to reach things farther yeah so that's a tendon transfer but now since um since maybe what three or four years um and there has been some nerve transfers here in quebec and um, which consist of transferring a nerve from a good nerve like above the level of lesion connect it to a nerve at the below, below the level of the lesion to recuperate the function and we will see that more not for walking because walking is, is too complicated yeah. but for uh, people that are paralyzed you know uh, from the neck down for tetraplegic people just to improve the function of the hand just being able to raise the wrist or close or open the fingers that mm -hmm. will help a lot in terms yeah. of their own independence the functional yeah. aspect of the their yeah, yeah. So we, we will hear that more and more often, the nerve transfers. And it's um, there are more, more advantages to an, uh, from a nerve transfer than a tendon transfer, because with a tendon transfer, you have to wait at least one year before doing it. A nerve okay. transfer, it can be done very quickly. Oh, yeah, it's mm. faster. It's the faster. recovery is faster. The recovery, it, well, not the recovery is faster. Okay. Because if you transfer the nerve, um, uh, you know, the, the physiology tells you that the nerve will, uh, well, it should reconnect, but it will grow at a um, one millimeter per day or yeah, one yeah. Inch per, per month. So you will see changes probably six, nine months from the time right. you, you, uh, you uh, transferred the nerve. Mm -hmm, and with yeah. the nerve transfer, you don't have a cast. Whereas with a tendon transfer, the person is put in a cast. Okay. So imagine you're a tetraplegic, you have two, 
two arms to function, but one is immobilized in a cast for six to eight weeks, mm -hmm. then you're dependent for six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. so you, you go from being fairly independent uh, without the tendon transfer to being dependent for at least six to eight weeks. Yeah. Mm. So w you will start to hear more and more about nerve transfers. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, I kind of want to make the parallel between spinal cord lesions and uh, let's say strokes. Because as we know, someone who, who suffers from a stroke uh, will probably most likely recuperate a certain amount of function just because of neuroplasticity in the brain and neuroplasticity happens, you know, within the cell bodies, they, they, they communicate with, with other cells to try to create different networks. And I just, my question was, why isn't that possible in a spinal cord? Because spinal cords are basically made of neurons mm -hmm. uh, and they're not, that different from the ones we find in the brain, right? A neuron is a right. neuron. Yeah. And so I know that someone with a spinal cord lesion will have, uh, like, can have a certain amount of motor function back. Like the, as we saw in class, you know, the Asia scale can, can change, you know, you can have, uh, your triceps can regain a little bit of function. So there is a little bit of plasticity, but is that really neuroplasticity or is it, yeah. or is it oh, just, yeah. Nerves waking up, kind of. No, no. Well, it could be both. It could be both. Oh, it's yeah. a mix. Okay. okay. Uh, because the you know with the uh, uh, in English we say CVA I don't, for hemiplegic. You know, with, yeah. when you have a brain pro uh, with a yeah. artery problem in the brain, um, it's it, it, it's the, the the part of the um, of the brain lacks in oxygen. Mm -hmm. because it has circulatory problems because the, the artery just ruptured. Well, with a, even with a traumatic injury, you have that, you know, in the spinal, at the spinal cord level. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely plasticity in the neural and uh, ne neurological, uh, neural plasticity in the spinal cord, okay. for sure. So I'm not ready to say that it's so different. However, if you have a traumatic lesion, of course, uh, if the the, uh, the neuron is severed, it's cut. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it won't regenerate because, and it gets very complicated, you know, <laughs> with, with the, the uh, pathophysiology of a, of a spinal cord. Mm -hmm. um, there are several things that happens at different times. You know, it's not only uh, one event at a one specific time, and you did, you know, you would give an injection and everything would start to come back. Come back. It's not doing like that because several, it's multifactorial and multiphasic. There are several mm -hmm. phases uh, happening. Yeah. A few minutes after the injury to many months after. So, but there is definitely plasticity uh, going on. Same thing as uh, for a, an hemiplegic person, for sure. Okay. Um, but there are a lot of um, toxic material in the spinal cord. So the spinal cord wants to regenerate, but it cannot because of those toxic things. Now, mm -hmm. why are those toxic things are there? I'm not a specialist in that, but from what I read, it's because if the spinal cord would recuperate, you know, the connection could be like, at, uh, um, it could go anywhere not okay. in a specific track, because as we know, in the spinal cord, everything is well-placed. Every function is in a specific track. Mm -hmm. So now if everything is intermingled, mm. uh, you're, no, uh, you're not, uh, um, you're not yeah. more functional than, uh, than, than before. Uh, than if it would go right. in the right track, you know? So, mm -hmm. uh, right. uh, so there are things that happens that will prevent the, that regeneration. Now, okay. with a spinal cord, you, it, it's not necessarily 100% of the neurons that are affected. So there are a certain, there is a certain proportion of the neurons that will be spared. We call that in our jargon, uh, the uh, 
spare the white matter rim in the white matter of the spinal cord there are neurons that will stay intact now mm -hmm. is the progression or the uh, uh, the fact that the person uh, improves in function is due to the spared white matter in maybe maybe mm -hmm. there are highways that in, in the spinal cord that when we are neurologically intact we don't use them but when you have an injury you start using them like, like it would be like a um uh in a, in service, a, um, mm -hmm. a parallel uh, highway let's say mm -hmm. that, uh, that usually is not used but if uh, after the, the an injury it is used is the improvement due to that you know there are uh, the um you mentioned earlier theodore you know the in, at the uh, in the neurons, the, the intact neurons will try to connect with the injured neurons to to try to have more function. Is it due to that? Um, maybe we don't there, there are know. several hypotheses. It's okay. probably a combination of all that. There's so much thing that we yeah. don't know still to this day about spinal cord. The right? more you know, the less you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so complicated. Yeah. yeah. So but the, the there way... is definitely plasticity. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. But if if I can summarize, like from what I from what I understand, the difference between someone who has a stroke and a spinal cord lesion, in the spine is basically a highway, and if if you if you have a traffic jam at that at that highway, then cars will not be able to go through, right? Through so him. it's kind of so there is plasticity, but not so much as in uh, as in the brain, because the brain it's. It's just millions and millions of highways. And, but the spine, it's really just many highways, but they all go in the same direction, kind of. A... Yes, you could say, yeah, you could say that. Yeah. Uh, and also the brain, you had, you have the centers there. Yeah, um, everything is in the same place. Yeah. Spinal cord, it's the highway. Yeah. As mm -hmm. you mentioned, uh, if it's blocked there, you have a traffic, complete traffic jam. Nothing mm -hmm. goes down, nothing so. goes up. Mm -hmm. But if there is a, ja a traffic jam on a Friday on a bridge, <laughs> in Montreal, <laughs> it goes it goes too slowly. Then yeah. that's an incomplete leash. That would be you know right. Uh, could compare that to an incomplete. It, you go with you go through with the car, but it takes you more time to get home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So okay, uh, you have you you retain function, but it's not normal function. Yeah, exactly. We talked about ABT uh, a few minutes ago the intervention uh, oriented uh, to a task to a, a bit more functional should i say but before as you start your profession what was the intervention that we, you you were using is it like in gym you were lifting uh, weights and uh, the, the patient would uh, lift weights for maybe 15 minutes and go on after that or because the mentality has really changed through um, the years right well i would say that <laughs> hasn't changed a lot not that much okay no no because it works yeah uh, we back in those days we were doing yes specific strengthening but if i uh, and I, I i will talk uh, for myself because yeah. it throughout my practice i worked maybe i don't know 85 percent of the time in function i strengthened mm -hmm. in function and when i started working that's what I liked uh, to work in function. Mm -hmm. So there's a the goal at the end, right? That's it's not right. like just building a muscle and that's it. You're you're it's having a goal at the end. Yeah, I I tell to the patients, you know, the, we're building a house. Mm -hmm. So if the foundation is not strong, don't build a wall on that. It will just crumble, collapse. Yeah. <laughs> so you need specific exercises, but you need task oriented exercises as well it's it's a it's a combination of both you cannot say i do only this or i do only that it will not work mm -hmm. it's a combination of those things because to do a functional thing at least you need the strength of a certain muscle a, yeah. a certain muscle group so you might work them specifically but at the end you go into the function so that aspect hasn't changed a lot in the sense that back in those days, we were doing push-ups. We're still doing push-ups because mm -hmm. patients have what they use to transfer it. They don't have the use of their legs. 
Mm -hmm. you know? Set to stand for those who, are, who can stand up. Uh, we will strengthen in the, um, in the rolling aspect so that they're able to roll from one side to the other to, to, and then be able to, uh, to sit up. So mm -hmm. that hasn't changed. What changed a lot is the technology. Surrounded it. Surrounded, yeah. yeah. Like today, we, we will use for the incomplete lesions, the uh, uh, locomotor uh, training with, uh, with uh, support. Uh, you have bi uh, bicycles, uh, electric bicycles coupled with the uh, FEA, functional electrostimulation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, back in the 80s, we, we did not really have that, you know. Yeah. So uh, the technology has changed, but the end goal is always the same. We want to bring the person to the highest level of independence as possible, mm -hmm. according to their level of injury mm -hmm. and according to the severity of injuries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do, um, how? What's the time frame for uh, neuroplasticity, like, uh, or for like, just just how can someone get better? I mean, I'm trying to figure this out. <laughs> um, like, until when are functional changes and, mo and and motor changes? Until when are they? Can they happen? So mm -hmm. I think during the class you mentioned like maximal gains can happen within a year, give or take a year. Does that mean that after a year, we cannot have more gain of function? Or is there a plateau? Is like, could you explain a little bit there, more? There well, there will be a plateau. Where the plateau is, we don't know. Okay. okay. And uh, is, uh, I'm not ready to say that you know, after you have the maximal change at one year, okay. it depends. Some people, they improve like very, very fast. Mm -hmm. Some others, it can be very, very slowly. But generally speaking, uh, it's very tough to say what's going to happen in the first month because any, someone can be completely paralyzed. And then after that month or during that month, they will recuperate. Mm -hmm. Some people will recuperate very slowly. Some others will recover very, very fast. And of course, the faster you recuperate in terms of time post-trauma, if it's a traumatic lesion, of course, better is the prognosis. But generally speaking, we say that the majority of the neurological changes, which is different from a functional changes, Okay. okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Neurological changes is within three, the first three months. Three That's months. why we want to bombard the neuromuscular system within the, those uh, first three months, because this is where the plasticity will work uh, most. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that it stops at three months. It just says, or the, with the, the different research, it says that after three months, the, uh, the slope of progression will go uh, uh, will be less uh, progressive. You know, it's going to go up slowly. Uh, some people, they, they said that they still recuperated after three years, after four years. Now, that's not neurolo necessarily neurological um, mm. improvement. It's functional. Re so neurological is the plasticity of the spinal cord where the different things they, they try to recuperate. And the functional is that with the strength you have, well, you will, you will, uh, it, it's going to be less difficult to do things because you will learn some tricks. Mm -hmm. It's the, know, the way how you do it. Yeah, you, you will repeat the activity at home and, uh, and then you will, but, but that's a functional, we have a functional mm -hmm. pro progression. And that's okay. why we use ABT. Right, activity-based training is 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 to foster functional training in the task, so that they will get better at what they want to do. Right. Yes. So that's the whole and purpose. Of it. Yes, and as the person progresses, as the plasticity works in the spinal cord, you want the connection to be to go in the right direction. So that's why you use those functional activities. You will strengthen in the. Um, in, in, in the functional activities so that the, the proper connection, you hope that's where it's gonna go. So it's gonna go in the right track, mm -hmm. not going to go in a different direction. Yeah. 
And how we were talking about like a prognosis and stuff like that. How as a physiotherapist, do you make a prognosis and how do you tell the patient what's going on with that prognosis? Because as you said, it's, it's changed so much with the time. Like in the first month, you don't really know what's, what will be the evolution of his condition. But is there a good time to make a prognosis? And if there is, if, what's the way to tell the patient? That's a... Uh, <laughs> a big question, money enormous, question. Enormous, <laughs> enormous question. But uh, w uh, what you said is totally true. There is a time uh, to say it. There is a person to say it. And there is a way to say it. Mm -hmm. So not anybody can tell the person. Not, you don't tell the person. Uh, you don't say any. Uh, uh, you have to, to use the proper words to do that. Because you don't want to, to cut the hope of the person. You always mm -hmm. want the person to keep some hope. Uh, you, don't, you don't open the door wide open but you leave it open a little bit. Mm -hmm. So what usually when the, the, the question arises and it will, am I going to be able to walk? <laughs> Sample. That's, that, that's a classical question. And then what do you say? So what I would say um, is, uh, well, the, you know, the, the, first, the first three months comes into play. You know, this is where we have most of the progression within that first three months. Mm -hmm. Now, if it has been four months since the uh, trauma, let's say we're talking about the traumatic lesion, I'm going to tell the person, you know, the, most of the, the, the progression is within the first three months. It doesn't mean that it stops there. It continues, but it's lower. Mm -hmm. We've been at four months, you know, uh, it, it's um, it doesn't mean that y y the progression won't continue. It doesn't mean that it's going to stop there. We will see how it goes through how it goes through times. Very often in spinal cord, the uh, the answer is mm, we really don't know, and time will tell. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, and that. It, 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 it never satisfies the person, but that's that's the way it is. So I would say, you know, yeah, time will tell. It, it, time will tell us if it continues to improve, what's the rate of improvement, or, you know, in we have this situation right now, let's try another week or two weeks, you know, we'll work hard and we'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. And if it stays like that, well, maybe that's uh, that's the the, condi the limit of the condition. Yeah. Because we we cannot work over the limit of the condition. So right. Um, it's around those words that I would say. You know, the first three months is important, and where is the person situated in that three months? Now, when the question arises. Um, as I said, there is a, a time to say it, a person to say it, and a way to say it. Yeah. So sometimes the physio will tell, sometimes it could be the, the occupational therapist or the doctor. It depends very often on who's more comfortable, who the patient is more comfortable with. The relationship that you build with the patient. Who right. has it. Yeah. yeah. And in physiotherapy, we're fortunate enough to, to uh, pass a lot of time with the person. Mm. You know, we're working with them four or five days a week for 45 minutes, an hour. And, you know, we, we, we learn to know the person as a person. Mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that's, well, nursing staff also, occupational therapists also. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the doctor, they spend less time with the, the so uh, very often it's, we're going to designate a person to, tell the patient, okay, now, because of this, 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 um, don't think about walking. Yeah. Sometimes we have to say that clearly, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not a one person, person thing. You have to speak. I would speak to the, the team, the interdisciplinary team first, 
because that's not a one person thing mm -hmm. because everybody has to see the same thing because yeah. if one person says otherwise who do you think the person will believe you know you have 10 person <laughs> saying no <laughs> saying you won't walk and one person tells you you're gonna walk who do you think the person will believe not the nine person. one person yeah where is yeah. the hope and that happened uh, a few uh, maybe i remember one time it happened one person in the team said mm. yeah you will walk and we got stuck with that and then you you have to you know educate the person why it won't be possible then uh, yeah and, and that's not easy no and i really. remember one uh, young girl she was con she was a tetraplegic person uh, and uh, she was convinced she would walk she could barely bend their her elbows against gravity mm -hmm. so and she she was convinced she she would walk and the family was convinced she would walk and then you have to convince them that what you're doing uh is, and i would explain that to anybody you know i i, I hear what you say you want to walk but for now it's not possible well uh, are you anxious to get home And everybody was, yeah, of course. Now, <laughs> what will bring you home is your independence at the wheelchair level at this time. Mm -hmm. And then we'll see with time how it goes. And if someone appears in your legs, we'll evaluate and we'll work on it. But if something, if nothing comes back, in 2021, there's no therapeutic exercises there's no technology that will make things reappear if they're not there mm -hmm. what exists now is compensation an exoskeleton is compensate for the lack of muscular mm -hmm. muscular activity in the legs you know mm -hmm. yes the person can, will be able to walk with the exoskeleton but it's not neurological improvement it's just a right. compensation right. From an, uh, an artificial thing. Yeah. I would imagine when you announce the person that sh he or she will not be able to walk again, I would imagine, uh, I, well, I mean, I can't even imagine actually how that person would feel. It must be uh, such a shock to find out uh, that news. Can you just explain to us how you deal with the emotions because i'm sure those patients are very emotional uh, with you during during the therapy and uh, like how do you as a physiotherapist you your priority is to deal with their function like you know how they how they transfer and tr try to make their lives better but i'm sure you have to deal with those emotions and just explain to us how you How you do that? I'm not ready to say that the priority is functional things because the functional aspect is important, but the psychological mm -hmm. it goes okay. hand to hand. You cannot separate the, the two of them. Mm -hmm. And thank God for interdisciplinary approach. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, we work with psychologists because uh, we wouldn't be able to to work. Otherwise, it's really otherwise, difficult. You know? yeah. And thank God for the uh, the team approach. Because um, very often it's something when someone, a patient tells me that, you know, of course it, it affects us. So after the treatment, I would for sure pay a little visit to the side, my colleague, the psychologist, and we would, we will establish a strategy of intervention. Mm -hmm. Now, very often the patient will not want to see the psychologist. I'm not crazy. I don't need a psychologist, but you know, the psychologist is not there. And only for crazy people. So if the person doesn't want to see the psychologist, then the psychologist will do her, her or his intervention through us. So we'll okay. establish a strategy so that I'm gonna, uh, I, I'm gonna say things or I'm gonna do things with the patient from what the psychologist would tell me. Or better, if the person accepts to see the psychologist, Then very often the psychologist comes into the gym, or we will uh, we will agree on a certain type. Okay, now come with me. You know, come with me. Uh, meet the, the person, uh, the patient, and uh, we will work the three together 
for that 45 minutes, for example. Or as I do my exercises, the, uh, the psychologist will do her intervention with the patient. At the same so, time? Uh, at the same time. Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Sometimes, we were, you know, someone with a lot of uh, pain, I would do a massage in the neck and psychologist will be beside me and she will, would be talking with the patient or do a relaxation technique or visual, visualization techniques. So it's, it's, uh, it's a team effort. It's, that's the key, right? That's the key. As a physiotherapist, you don't really learn that at school. No. Unfortunately, yeah. there are not enough uh, courses on uh, on that for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's really by not, experience and uh... yeah, yeah. Of course, we're not psychologists; we do not diagnose things. But of course, as you said, Theodore, when person tells you, ask you if you're gonna uh, if they're gonna walk, and um, you think it's the proper time to tell them, then you know that. The person risk to to get depressed or something like that, but then I, I go and see the psychologist. That's okay. Now we I've had a very interesting, very interesting uh, discussion with that person. Now I think it would be important that you meet today or tomorrow, mm -hmm. or uh, depending on the emergency of the, of the things. Yeah. Sometimes people would tell me something and they would start to cry. You don't know really what to do. I take the phone. I uh, I phone the psychologist. Are you free? Yes. <laughs> Please. To my and we would do the intervention, the three of us. So you're really well well surrounded by oh, a lot sure. of people and like specialized people. That's yeah. I, that's the thing I didn't know at first because when you yeah. uh, when you, you're in the orthopedic world, most of the time you're alone. So maybe you have a question or something like that, and you try to improvise but at your level you have a lot of people that really are there to help you and uh, are sure, well yeah. surrounded yeah yeah it's the concept of interdisciplinary approach uh, so everything uh, everybody works uh, works together and we in rehab centers we need that of course if you're if you're a physio a clinician and you work in a private clinic uh, you don't unless you work in a building where you have the different services. Exactly. But yeah. then I would say that's a multidisciplinary approach. Yeah, different professionals, but are not necessarily connected to each other. Mingled. Whereas in the rehab center, everybody is in, at the, in the same building. Mm -hmm. Same building and in the, in the uh, same area. Like uh, we work in programs now. At the beginning, when I started working, we there were services, then departments. Now it's program. And the big difference in program is that whereas before, if I wanted to see the psychologist, her office was way at the other end of the rehab. Okay. And I had to walk a couple of minutes just to get there. And she wasn't there, so I had to come back to the gym. But now in programs, the occupational therapist, the social worker, psychologists, uh, physio are all in the same area. Mm -hmm. So I need something from the social worker. I just cross the, the corridor and she's there. So that's mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, the beautiful aspect of working in, uh, in program. Right. Uh, in certain centers, you even have the program is on the floor. So you have the nursing there, you have the gym that is on the same floor. But at, the, at our facility, we don't have that uh, architectural uh, arrangement. Mm -hmm. There are some centers that have that. So that's the, uh, the, the, um, the, the beautiful aspect of, the, of working in programs. Mm -hmm. But we definitely need the end. And the end result is, and you know, with two plus two is greater than four with an interdisciplinary approach for sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Could you um, walk us through, let's say, the day in the life of a tetraplegic? Uh, and just to be more specific, those people, like, let's take one um, in a chronic stage, you know, where the initial rehab was, was done and he's sent home, let's say. Um, what is the day in the life of that person? Because I would imagine that if you are unable to walk 
you can't move your legs, but you still have to mobilize them. Otherwise, you'll 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 have some some complications. You know, you'll have uh, uh, contractures and those kinds of things. So, what is a day like for them? Do they have to go to to a special center or to do extra physiotherapy, or do they are they able to mobilize themselves? Like, how is it for them? You talk about it in your class, like how difficult it was to put clothes on. Like yeah. for some people, it takes two hours. Like it's it's crazy because most of the time people don't know that side of the story of the, the person or this patient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, just putting a T-shirt on sometimes at the beginning of rehabilitation It takes 45 minutes just to put a T-shirt. So we just can't imagine right. putting the socks on, pants on, the sous-vêtements, the underwear. Um, that, that's a lot of work. And um, I remember one time I was uh, giving a conference with an occupational therapist. And uh, she told me that just to get dressed in the morning, you wake up, you're in bed. And, you, know, you, it, you need to do eight transfers from the bed to the chair to the chair to the toilet toilet to the chair etc and come back to the bed to get dressed just to get dressed and be ready to be washed and everything it takes eight transfers if you're able to transfer exactly if you're not able to transfer you have to wait for the person to transfer you and so it, it depends on the level of, of independence but just that you know you need eight transfers of course with time they, they get better with practice and the But it takes less time. But still, when I give my courses, I, I, I never say it's easier. I always say it's less difficult because yeah. it's always difficult. Mm -hmm. it, it takes so much energy. And that's a concept of energy conservation. We teach that to the person as they go through their rehab because it's very important. If you spend 100% of your energy to get dressed, and you don't have any energy to do fun things, then you just lie in bed all day long. So they have to choose, you know, what their priority is. Mm -hmm, to select. So yes, they, they, they basically, they, they have, the, let's say it's a, a traumatic lesion. So they go in the acute center, then they go into rehab center. And very often they, they will go either as an inpatient, depending on the level and severity of the lesion, in, in, an, um, in a, we call it well, a phase three um, center where you're not necessarily ready to go to, to the apartment, but you need that a little time there. Uh, you're, you're, you're less um, en cadre, you know, you're... Yeah. Uh, you're a bit more independent than before. You're, you're a little bit more independent, but not independent enough to go back home. Yeah. So you will go to this center because your your intensive rehab is finished. So you go to that center and for several weeks or sometimes a uh, few months, then you go home or you go, if, if you have a home or if you can go, To, uh, to your home, you know, mm -hmm. if you live in a second floor and you're in a wheelchair, there's no elevators, then you have, of course, you have to, uh, to move. Um, sometimes they will go in your acute rehab center and trade back home because it's safe enough and it's accessible, although it's not 100% adapted. It will mm -hmm. be with time, but it's adapted enough so that it can function in, in their own home. And um, if they go back home from the rehab center, usually they will continue as an outpatient, on an outpatient basis in a, a specialized center uh, where they have the equipment so that they continue to strengthen and work on their endurance. And, mm -hmm. and they, we, they will have learned how to mobilize themselves, how to stretch themselves so they don't develop contractures. And of course, through the continuum of, of care, uh, they will be taught of the different complications. Mm -hmm. They will be taught the different signs and symptoms so that they know what to do if something happens. So they will, they will become a, um, an expert in their mm. condition. 
And that's mm -hmm. what we want. We want them to be expert because if a problem occurs, then they know what to do. Is it an, a medical emergency or can it wait? For a bit longer. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that's the kind of the, the continuum. And time-wise, I would say it, it differs from one person to the other according to the level and severity of the lesion. It always depends on where, like how the, 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 how they uh, get better, how the condition evolves. So it depends also on the motivation of the patients. Yes. And uh, that, that's really the, the big thing. But how do they live at their house? Like, do they need a, a lot of um, adaptation most of the time? Or also this depends on the condition and the uh, evolution? Is it all... Yeah. Uh, different well, for today, each patient uh, it's much better than uh, in, in the past of course because we have more support in the community so we have people that have uh, c4 lesions c4 they can breathe on the, by, by themselves you know they can't lift their arms up they're not uh, strong enough but they can live on their own because they have support from the CLSCs and and the different help they, they need because they need help They're, they're totally dependent. They need someone to prepare their meal, sometimes someone to feed them. They cannot get dressed, they cannot get out of bed, they cannot transfer. Uh, they can mobilize themselves in the wheelchair with a motorized wheelchair, mm -hmm. uh, either with the hand or with the neck, if they don't have function of the shoulders and the hand. So with the neck movement, then they will be able to maneuver The, the chair. So with technology now, people can, uh, can some people, they can live on their own without going uh, to uh, San Deque or sometimes we, yeah. unfortunately, young people, they don't have a home, they don't have a place to stay. And unfortunately, they end up in CL, uh, mm. CHSLD. They, they, There's long-term no healthcare yeah. available, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. It's so not that it, yeah. it depends. Uh, it depends on the the, uh, the 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 level of injury, the severity of the injury, and also the uh, the environment of the person. You know, as I said, they have it. They live on a second floor. They cannot go back there. Uh, they don't have any support. They don't have any family because they, they, they're alone. Then they end up, and they need a lot of care. Yeah then they, they might end up in CHSLD. Or if they're fortunate enough, they can go home, uh, but they need a lot of support, external support, from CLSDs mm -hmm. or maybe the family members, although the family do not become their nursing staff. Yeah. Because otherwise they, they will just get... Uh, Burn out. <laughs> mm. Yeah. You, uh, you talked before... These days, we see more and more elderly having spinal cord le lesions <clears throat> and fractures. Um, what could you say to the general population, to the old folks out there? <laughs> what could you say to them to, uh, to help them prevent something like this from happening? What's the best way, do you think? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> This one, I have to think a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, um, the, Of course, it caution is always the, the first thing i remember some people you know the uh during the winter there's a lot of snow on the roof they and would, they go uh, up get up their crazy. ladder on the roof they, they fall down um but sometimes it's just a plain accident that you cannot prevent you know unexpected you, yeah that's why you trip well you trip too bad um, uh. but if you're an elderly person Of course, with age, uh, we have less coordination, a little bit of less strength. And, um, so if you wake up at night, it's always a good thing to have a little light somewhere. Oh, okay, yeah. And when you sit up, you wait before standing up. Because, you know, if you sit up fast in the morning, it happens to us, you know, we mm -hmm. get a little dizzy. Well, if you're 90 years old and you wake up fast and you stand up fast, You mm. might lose a little bit your balance. You might fall. So sometimes maybe just those little tricks um, will permit them to save them a fall and potentially yeah. a, uh, a big problem. Doesn't mean that because you fall, you're going to have a, a, 
uh, neurological problem, but at least yeah. decrease the risk of falling and uh, That's right. having some and respect the limit there to respect their limit. Yeah, that's the right. difficult. Even uh, in our age, it's uh, difficult to know where's the it limit. Is. Yeah. It is, yeah. I remember my father, he was kind of 96 and he was mowing the, still mowing the lawn. Really? And, uh, and he had, the, 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 you know, kind of the little hills in, uh, in the front of the house and stairs. So he would, he would lift up the mower and I said, Oh, tell me I will go, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it, I, it, Makes me exercise and, yeah. but still yeah. potential. The potential. Right. Danger. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I went on his roof a couple of times yeah. because he wanted to go, and he uh, was over eight. I said, "No, no, no, I will." Go. <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> yeah. you know, I'll the, take uh, the risk. <laughs> yeah. Wow, yeah. <laughs> the, it, respecting the uh, your mm. own limit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there a patient that a case of a patient that you find? Uh, found inspiring or you surprised you the most in your career like you 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 thought you would not be able to walk for example and he he did like quicker than you thought or something like that Do you have a special story to talk about the uh, i would say everybody i treated they all impressed me oh. because whatever the level of the lesion and whatever the severity of the lesion those people they have so much resilience mm -hmm. you know And um, uh, very often people, uh, they will hear, well, if you want, you can do it. You know, yeah. they, people, they will encourage you. I see very to peu. You can do it. But it doesn't work like that. If your body or your condition doesn't want you to, you, know, you will not be able to walk. However, those people or any part, whether the person is on a ventilator or is able even to, to walk. They, they all work so hard to, to try to be as much independent as they can. So they, those people, they're all inspiration to me. You know, you, when I have a little pain somewhere, I just think about them well, more, <laughs> more than- It's been, it's been worse. Than, you know? <laughs> so I will talk it a little bit, <laughs> but um, they're, they're all inspiring uh, and, They're all great in the sense that I've treated the construction workers, psychologists, doctors, dentists, and they, but, but for me, the, the, what I like most is the elderly people because they have so much experience in life. You know, they, they've been through maybe Second World War, they will tell you that. And they've been, so, they, they've been through so much. Wow. And they're like 80, 85, and they have a spinal cord lesion. And, you know, sometimes it's say, oh, you know, you're young. Oh, it, it, it must be very tougher than it. A spinal cord lesion for me is tough at any age. Mm, yeah. Young age, you know, it's tough. When you start a little older, you start to have a family. It's tough. Uh, you're towards retirement. It's tough. You just retired. It's tough. You, you're in your retirement. It's tough. So every, I think every category, age category, For me, it is a, is a tough time to. There's no better age group that you would say, ah, oh, you know, why oh, he had his life and you know. Yeah, and like, that's it, like, like, like that. So, yeah. so that's why uh, all the people I've treated, they're so inspired. Uh, they inspired me because because of that, the the resilience, the they resilience, have right, and all the energy, and you're in a survival mode, you know, and very often the the you don't know you have that kind of power you know it's just when you're faced with it well there are two options you you don't do anything and you decay mm -hmm. or you fight through it and most of them they, they fight through it that's crazy yeah 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 i think that's that's really enlightening to like whenever something bad happens to you Yeah, you reflect on this you, and say, you oh. think about these people because there, there, there's a saying, right? It says the worst thing that happened to you is the worst thing that happened to you. Mm -hmm. If for someone having a bad score at an exam <laughs> is the worst thing, but that person does not know what true hunger is, uh, lives, you know, lives in a modern society, has everything mm -hmm. that he or she needs. 
well, that is the worst thing that happened to that person. And that's fine. But having this perspective in mind, mm -hmm. like just think about those guys, those, uh, yeah. those people. And, yeah. you know, it's true what you say. And I yeah. remember that woman that was coming to, uh, to our center because of, uh, of uh, she was walk, she was able to walk and she had a back problem. Because in those days, we, we would treat uh, sometimes uh, orthopedic people. So okay. she had a back problem. And every time she came back to me, she, she would tell me, well, you know what? When I quit my treatment, I always cry because I see all those people in wheelchairs and I'm complaining of a back problem. And I told her, well, you know, it, it's as you said that Theodore, it's, it, you have a back problem. It's your problem. So, yes, you can compare yourself to others, but uh, you still have that problem and it's your problem and it's your priority to try to get better. Mm -hmm. so, whatever the problem, yes, you can be you can be relative to other people, but still it's your problem. It's like the exam you said, there are if you flunk an exam, there are worse things in life, but you flunk it and that's your problem and uh, it makes you... Uh, mad about that and you will work harder to have a better grade yeah. so i will work with you so that you get better yeah so, that's the mentality you need to yeah. have uh, in everyday yeah, life yeah. it's not just in the types of big conditions but in everyday yeah. life uh, yeah really and, and, and i remember another young woman she had a um a tumor in her neck and she was able she was walking you know like you and me Mm -hmm. and, but the big, the big problem was the uh, neurological pain. She okay. had so much pain, and pain is very uh, abstract. You know, you, you don't see that. It's not concrete. Mm -hmm. You don't see it. Uh, it's not written on your forehead, I have pain. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I asked her, what, what frustrated you most? And she told me that her family told her, well, you're lucky because you're walking. Yeah. yeah. Maybe walking, it's true. And sometimes, well, you know, you don't complain, you're walking. You know, mm -hmm. you don't hear that. But if you have pain and the pain, we know that it can have great consequences on all aspects of your life, so not mm -hmm. only physical aspect, all aspects of your life. And that's what frustrated her most. People did not understand uh, her complaints because she was able to walk. Yeah, walking is is not uh, the only thing. This is why it's important as a physiotherapist, I think, to ask the patient what's the goal for him or her. Because mm. what do you need? What, what do you need? Because at the time, like uh, far, far before, for example, if you take a doctor, he was like offering one option. And he, he thought it was the best option for her, but he didn't ask the, what was going on in her life or in his life to know uh, what do you want to do and what's your goal. So now really the mentality has changed. And now we're focusing more on their goal than their, my, the, the physiotherapist's goal. That's and, really... And a, that's, that's a good point. And we have to be careful about that. You know, you oh, know yeah. we have our therapeutic goals, mm -hmm. but there are the patient's needs. Yeah, exactly. Although though, those needs have to be realistic, you know, if you uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to fly. Well, sometimes sometimes a person would tell me, "I want to. My goal is to walk, and I'm going to be walking in three weeks. I'm going to be walking, and the, he has a complete lesion, and yeah. it's been let's say three months post trauma. So we know that the chances are very very slim that he's going to walk, mm -hmm. and. I remember wo uh, working on his arms, the upper body to, to strengthen and said, well, why don't you work more my legs because I'm going to be walking in three weeks. And mm. then you have to explain then that, that you no, know, it, it doesn't work, unfortunately, that, that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it's yeah, a mix yeah. and uh, you need to understand like uh, what's possible and what's not for the patient. Yeah, that, but yeah. yeah. But we have to listen to the patient's need. What are their goals? And of course, and we have to separate that from our th therapeutic goals. I remember one time the, a colleague that, uh, that she told me that she was working with that 75-year-old woman, woman and she had the potential of walking. And she was in a wheelchair and uh, 
she she told me that Michelle, she you know she doesn't want to to stand up and walk. And I said, fine. So just work with her on a wheelchair level, you know, mm -hmm. because this is where she's comfortable. But tell her that if she changes her mind, then just tell me, and then we'll work together uh, with the walking aspect. So it's kind of frustrating because as a therapist, you say, well, she has a potential of walking. How many people would like to have her condition? Yeah. And she wants to sit down in the chair and move around in the in the motorized wheelchair. But that's what, what she wanted. That was that was her uh, her need. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that's why I'm saying we have to be careful. We have to separate sometimes the therapeutic goal versus the patient's need or their goals. If their goal is to be at the wheelchair level, even though they have the potential to walk, well, you Stick can to try. It. You you can you can uh, uh, discuss with them. But in the end point, if that's their need, then you work at the wheelchair level. Mm -hmm. All right. You cannot want more than the person. Exactly. If you, yeah. want, if you even if you think you have the potential, if they have the potential. Because mm -hmm. at the end, the patient is doing the big work. He's training. He's exercising, and uh, yeah, you cannot do more than he wants. That's yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. And I can understand you... the frustration sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And if, if their uh, their need changes with time, that well, we we'll just adapt. Because exactly, it's yeah. a therapy, like in any any other profession, we're great to to adapt. We're kind of elastic, you know. We can do several things. We're we're uh, we're malleable, you know. We will adapt to all the situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. That's a really amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> oh. I think we're good. Thank yeah. you very much, Michelle. Okay. Yeah, Michelle. Well, thank you it's very been much. a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. And I hope what I said is, is kind of clear enough. <laughs> yeah, <you know>? it's, <laughs> it makes sense. It makes sense. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much. much for the, the invitation. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming here today and uh, keep up the good work. <laughs> I think you're you're spreading the the good message towards our 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 colleagues. And uh, we're very lucky to have you. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice day.